Good morning. Morning. Good morning. I love your shirt. Thanks. It's my Halloween Christmas sweater. That's awesome. It's one of the better things I've done for myself. For the second half of the semester, I made your um, attendance sheet of book order by first names instead of last names. That's how the participants list is. And it's a lot faster, shockingly enough. <laughs> so. All righty. So just to sort of catch you up with what we're doing this week. So today we're continuing the lecture about trait theory. And then on Wednesday, we might have a few slides to still go over. Uh, and then we also have our discussion day. So you do have reading. Um, there's a couple sort of diametrically opposed uh, readings in the pieces book. And then there is a reading on Blackboard uh, written by some people of color. Um, to actually get some diversity opinion on traits as well. Um, so then on Friday, we will start learning already. Um, not that we're not learning already. Oh, oh, oh God, bad jokes. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> but we'll start talking about learning theory in particular. Um, happy Monday. Uh, looking forward to starting another great week, second half of the semester, believe it or not. Here we go. Um, so let me go ahead and get our PowerPoint rolling here. And then I can screen share it. Okay, okay. So we've been talking about sort of traits more in general and in a more abstract way. And so now we're gonna start talking about some of the actual traits and how we break these things down and how we use that to study everything. Um, so again, as I mentioned on Friday, a lot of this has to do with essentially how we do most of psychological science these days. Um, a lot of it is research about traits, essentially. Let me back up so you can actually see me here. No, just need to adjust my camera. There we go. That's better. Okay, get out the chat here for any and all questions. All righty. So people will focus on different clusters of traits. Um, and some people will focus on a single trait. So what do per people with a particular personality trait do? What does having, you know, one particular personality trait indicate about you as a person, particularly as a person, you know, psychologically? Yeah, we're always going to be looking at how does this relate to things like, um, you know, your psychological well-being, things along those lines. So 
you want to examine the correlations between one trait and many behaviors or other traits. So if you've started doing um, the studies for your extra credit, uh, I sent an email last week, I think. It shows you how to get all signed up for SONA. I uh, recommend going in there. There's a lot of studies up there already. Uh, but a lot of them will be doing this, essentially. So they'll have you fill out questionnaires. And the questionnaires will be about various traits, generally. Sometimes they'll be about behaviors or how you're feeling. Um, but in general, you're trying to see like how a particular trait relates to those other things. So an example here is authoritarianism. So people who are high on authoritarianism will turn their will over to an external authority to avoid having to make personal choices. They enjoy giving orders, which they expect to be followed without question. So uh, the ideas about authoritarianism as we understand them now is really based on the atrocities of Hitler and the Nazis. Um, essentially, how could people do those things or allow those things to happen? And authoritarianism is one of the ways that people sort of hypothesized to make sense of that. So people who are high on authoritarianism show prejudice against minority groups in general, essentially. So anyone who's an underrepresented minority, um, they tend to be anti-democratic. So that doesn't mean they're anti the Democratic Party. They don't necessarily like the democratic system. They want to be able to just do what they want to do without having to go through votes and all those things. And they're pseudo conservative, which means that they accept conventional and traditional values, but also accept destructive values like cynicism, punitiveness, uh, and violence against minority groups like violent anti-Semitism in the case of uh, you know, Hitler or some of the neo-Nazis. Um, so, you know, certainly, obviously, something that's not great. In terms of behavior, they tend to be very deferential and respectful to people uh, in higher power, but they're rude and disrespectful to people with lower power. Uh, they don't respond well to challenges about their seemingly inconsistent behavior and values. Um, and some recent findings in terms of research is that they tend to be uncooperative and unflexible, or inflexible, sorry. <laughs> And they have fewer positive emotions. So we actually call this a, it's like a trait called low positive emotionality. It's one of the best predictors of depression, actually. And um, they support what they see as strong political candidates. Um, more than just an acquiescent response set, they're not just saying, like, yeah, I agree with whatever you tell me to agree with. Um, an individual, this is really an individual difference variable. Um, and it can be used to explain which individuals would be most likely to follow a leader like Hitler. And it, it's a very good example of how a personality trait can be used to understand a complex social phenomenon. Like, why are there people who are still, you know, Nazis, basically? Well, they're probably high on this characteristic. And so it sort of goes with their personality. That certainly doesn't excuse it. And not everyone who like has a tendency to be high on this will end up being a white supremacist, right? Um, but certainly uh, this is something that we can address, say, if that person happened to come from there. There's also the many trade approach. Uh, so the idea is who does the important behavior? So you examine correlations between one behavior and many traits. So the behavior might be something like um, self-harm. It might be something like, in the case of my research, disordered eating. Uh, it might be something like, you know, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, participating in, you know, again, uh, these uh, white supremacist rallies, right? Uh, so one of the ways that this has been researched is using something called the California Q-set, 
and it has a hundred personality descriptions that are more complex than single word traits. So they'd be like three phrases. Uh, so example items, one item would be is unpredictable and changeable in behavior and attitudes. Another one is, is vulnerable to real or fancy threat. Another one is, is a talkative individual. Right, so it's not just talkative, gives a little more context. Um, and so the, these are sorted into a distribution. Um, and so you ask people to uh, sort these and to say like whether or not it matches them or you might ask uh, other people to sort of rate them or you can do essentially like how do these seem to lump together for you there's lots of different ways you can use it but then what you can do is you can compare these characteristics within an individual so an example here is delay of gratification so this is denying oneself immediate pleasure for long-term gain um, there are generally sex differences when we do research on this. We tend to see males delay less than females. Um, that may be less of a sex difference that is based on biological factors and more of a gender difference that is based on social cultural ideas uh, because of the ideas that like women should be, you know, sort of meek and patient and things along those lines. Um, we see in girls, uh, ages three to 11, it's kind of delayed. I mean, this is hard for a kid to do. Uh, and it correlates with intelligence, competence, attentiveness, and resourcefulness in those girls. Uh, in boys of the same age, it actually correlates with shyness, quietness, compliance, and anxiousness. So again, those are traits we would typically think of as stereotypically feminine traits. Again, not that these are inborn, but that these are what's sort of expected in our society for people who are uh, biologically female, right? Uh, but in both genders, it correlates with planfulness, reflectiveness, and reasonableness. Uh, so ego control, is related to uh, delay in both genders. So ego control is self-control or inhibition. And then ego resiliency, which is essentially another term for psychological adjustment. It's essentially like your ability to bounce back if something stressful happens. Um, that is related to delay, but only in girls. And again, the difference here may be based on societal expectations. It's also related to behaviors like drug abuse. Um, and so it's predicted by several characteristics rated about 10 years earlier. Uh, and depression. So risk factors for women for depression include over control and being shy and reserved. Uh, and risk factors for men include under control and being unsocialized and aggressive. And what we often see in men who present for therapy is they typically are treated for like a substance use disorder first uh, because uh, they typically are self-medicating long before uh, they come in to actually get help. So what I'm going to find right now is a little video uh, that tells you about delay of gratification. All right. I'm going to do a new share so that you'll be able to see it. And some of you may have seen this before in other classes, but it is a classic. Okay, so that's your... All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one. So then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go 
do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. back okay so you can either eat it right now or you can wait either way okay okay how'd you do did you do good you did yeah. you wanted to eat it didn't you yeah so did I tell you to give you another one okay now you can have both Right, any reactions to that feel free to either unmute or say them in the chat they're so cute that was so mean <laughs> there's like um a trend going around on social media where you do that to your kids you like leave them with a piece of candy and like leave it recording to see what their reaction will be and some <laughs> of them are hilarious <laughs> i believe it yeah, I was going to comment the same thing where like, I've done it with my students where I'll give them a small bowl of candy and I walk away for a while and I'll record their reactions. And I had one who was sitting there and going, don't eat it. I'm not going to eat it. I'm just going to drink some water. I won't eat it. It just reminds me of uh, one of my friends as her daughter started to talk when she was going to sleep at night, she would say stuff to herself like, it's okay, baby girl, it's okay. Like clearly things her parents had said to her. Um, yeah, the, 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 they won't notice if I take tiny bites or if I take a bite from the bottom and put it back down. I think one of my favorites is the little girl who just like before she's even out of the room shoves the whole thing in her face. Yeah, yeah. She was like, I don't need another one. I'm good with this one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And obviously they all get at least one marshmallow. So they're not depriving them. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can kind of see the of gratification is hard for kiddos, especially when you put them in a scenario where there's nothing to distract them. Right. Um, so yeah, definitely fun. Definitely funny. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the description. It's like, say less. Like, okay, you can stop talking now. I'm just going to eat it. Um, yeah. I, as I was watching it, I was like, ah, oh, I miss like playing this in class and hearing your reactions live. <laughs> yeah, that one little boy was really stressed out. It was, I love all the ones who were like, like pretending to eat it as if that would help them somehow. Yeah, they're cuties, obviously. Alrighty, so that was the many trade approach. And now we're going to talk about the essential trade approach. And so this is what a lot of traits, um, 
perspective people have really focused on. So which traits are the most important? Which ones really matter? And so they're trying to reduce all the potential traits down to just a few. And so Murray came up with the idea of 20 needs. Uh, Block came up with just two that we've already mentioned, ego control and ego resiliency. Um, a lot of people have done this through factor analytic approaches. So they give people like either short phrases as we just described or single words for traits, have them say how much it applies to them and then they factor analyze and see which ones sort of group together. Uh, so I think came up with three, extroversion, neuroticism and psychoticism. Um, neuroticism is an old word that essentially means like anxiety, depression, sort of the internalizing things. Psychoticism would be experiencing active hallucinations, things along those lines. The interesting thing about Isink is that his was not just factor analytic, it was also theoretical because he based his model on the idea that important traits should be heritable. So he was kind of one of these first behavioral geneticists. And he emphasized the social role and insisted the things he studied be observable. So he was looking for observable behaviors. So psychoticism, he said, it ends up being like a blend of aggressiveness, creativity, and impulsiveness. Neuroticism is um, emotional reactivity and emotionality. And then extroversion is sociability and impulsiveness. And neuroticism and, extra, and extroversion in particular, so those first two listed there, um, have sometimes been called the big two because they come up over and over and over and over again when you do this type of research. Uh, Cattell came up with 16 traits. So if you remember, we talked about him with the 16 PF. Um, he called these essential traits. And recently people have said that like 20, like Murray or 16, like Cattell is just too many. Um, Cattell collected huge amounts of data uh, he had behavior in everyday settings, questionnaires, lab data with psychophysical measures, which includes things like heart rate, blood pressure, skin conductance, things along those lines. And then Telegan, Alka Telegan, um, came up with positive emotionality, negative emotionality, and constraint. So if you look, Isink and Telegan are actually really similar, right? Um, and Telegan is a really huge name in this area today. Um, Telegan, along with my former professor, Yossi ben Poref, is the author of all of the most recent revisions of the MMPI, so the MMPI 2RF we talked about, the MMPI 3 that's coming out this semester. I actually have now signed up to do a workshop on that to find out what's different. Uh, Telegan is very well respected, not only in the trade approach, but also in terms of uh, psychometrics, so uh, using statistics to look at these things. And we've mentioned already when we talked about our cultural chapter, the big five, right? And so these are the ones people think about when everyone in psychology had to do a 480 project, a capstone research project. Anyone who was going to do personality was like, I'm going to look at the big five because that's personality. And I mean, yes, it captures a lot of it, but the ones that I had in this class, I was just like, really? You took a whole semester with me and that's the only way you can think of to measure personality? <laughs> um, obviously, there are other ways to get at it, right? <laughs> but this is a very good one that's been reproduced quite a bit. So the big five were discovered uh, in part due to what's called the lexical hypothesis. And the lexical hypothesis is that important aspects of life will be labeled with words in that culture's language. And if something is truly important and universal, there will be many words for it in all languages. So essentially the big five was looking for traits that have the most words and are the most universal across languages. So if we look at, you know, Spanish, English, Chinese, right? Afrikaans, they should all have words for these things. Um, so 
They do this with factor analysis. And in fact, many of the original ones, they just went through dictionaries uh, in the different languages and pulled out any term that was related to a trait. So implications here is that the traits are considered orthogonal, which means unrelated. So like being high on extroversion isn't going to influence your score on neuroticism necessarily. Um, the big five can bring order to many research findings. If the findings are consistent across a particular trait, for example, and the big five are more complex than they seem at first. Uh, the labels are oversimplified and in fact can be potentially misleading as well. So just to give us a refresher, uh, the big five are ocean, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And each of them is going to have their own slides. So if you didn't get them all down when I was just rattling them off, no worries. And we're even going in ocean order to help you all remember them. So openness to experience is also sometimes called intellect. And to be honest, that might be a more accurate term for this trait. Um, this is the most controversial one. It seems to perhaps measure approach to intellectual matters or maybe even IQ, like basic intelligence. But there's also an element of value of cultural matters like literature and art and also creativity and perceptiveness. Uh, so for example, I've been talking about hypnotizability in my intro class and openness to experience is actually correlated with your ability to be hypnotized. So uh, I'm very hypnotizable. I like to think it's because of high openness to experience. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, it might just be I'm very suggestible. I don't know. <laughs> um, people who uh, are high on this are viewed by others as creative, open-minded and clever. Um, but as you see here, this is less replicable about across samples and cultures. This is the one that we don't necessarily see consistency. Like when we do these type of research, regardless of culture, regardless of language, we tend to get five traits, but like this one varies a lot. And I have charts later that'll sort of show you that in more detail. Uh, in terms of life outcomes, you could have some positive ones, like just having artistic interests, but you can also have some negative ones or uh, openness to experience may be linked to drug use, which in turn, of course, might end up being linked to drug abuse. So not all good. All right, conscientiousness, not consciousness, right? This is not just being awake, conscientiousness. Um, it's responsibility, consistency, moral reasoning. Uh, someone's conscientious if they tend to keep track of what they need to do, be where they need to be on time, if not early. Um, conscientiousness has been used to select employees um, and it does have a predictive validity for supervisor ratings of job performance of 0.41, which may not seem that high, but is actually pretty high for a correlation in psychology. Um, it can predict things like absenteeism, uh, whether an employee is going to steal from you <laughs> and job performance. It's also less biased than the so-called aptitude tests that are often given, which do have cultural bias in them, uh, as well as obviously educational bias. Uh, it predicts success in college better than the SAT and actually better than high school GPA. So I'll say that again, because this often shocks people. So just you, where you are in the trait of conscientiousness predicts how well you'll do in college better than your SAT scores and better than your high school GPA. And that makes sense, right? Once you get to college, a lot of what you have to do is self-directed, right? I'm not having you all turn in homework every day, right? And giving you feedback on it. Um, so you have to like motivate yourself to do the reading and things along those lines. Interestingly, it's not related to IQ at all, right? So you can be just of average intelligence, but do really well in college because you're very conscientious, right? And you work to get your tasks done. 
there's some theories that conscientiousness may underlie motivation in general. So this might just like explain human motivation, which is really interesting. It predicts longer life expectancy, probably because you're conscientious about your health, right? You're going to go to the doctor more quickly if something's wrong. Um, you're going to probably exercise, eat well, things along those lines. Um, and it's positively correlated with years of schooling, which makes sense, right? The more conscientious you are, the more motivated you are, the more you may apply yourself to uh, an undergrad or a post undergrad degree. So that's conscientiousness. Extroversion is being social, outgoing, active, outspoken, sometimes dominant, sometimes adventurous. Extroversion is the one that's easiest for people to wrap their heads around because we use the terms introvert and extrovert colloquially and they have the same meaning as they do in psychology, right? Um, so that's helpful. And so there are advantages to being extroverted. They tend to have higher status. Uh, they tend to be rated as more popular and physically attractive, even if you, know, you didn't know their personality and you looked at them objectively and they wouldn't be necessarily. Uh, and they tend to be higher in that positive emotionality. The disadvantage is mate poaching or mate competition, right? Um, this is that mean girls relational aggression crap that everybody hates getting into, right? Uh, but in general, they have pretty good life outcomes. They tend to be happy, grateful, have long lives. Partially, I think, because humans are social creatures and we thrive off of social interaction. When we have that social interaction, it tends to make us accountable in terms of taking care of our health. Um, so because of that, they tend to be healthy and their relationships tend to be more successful. Again, thinking about this from a psychological perspective, most likely because they probably talk about any issues in their relationships rather than letting them fester. All right, agreeableness. Um, so it can be conformity and compliance. So sort of following around along with what people want you to do. But it also includes things like likability and warmth. These people tend to be cooperative and easy to get along with. Random, they smoke less, however. So like it's not just succumbing to peer pressure. Uh, women tend to be higher on agreeableness than men. Again, I think this is due to societal expectations of what women's roles are. Uh, among kiddos, uh, if you are higher on agreeableness, you are less likely to be bullied. Probably because the bully just is like, oh, I can't pick on them, right? <laughs> um, and you can probably maybe talk your way out of things. And then in terms of life outcomes, they tend to be psychologically well adjusted. Uh, they tend to do well with heart health and they tend to have dating satisfaction. And then there's neuroticism. And neuroticism has always been interesting to me because it's the only one of the big five that they decided to negatively balance, right? All the rest of them are pretty positive things. Um, and obviously all of them are on a continuum. It's not just you have this trait, yes, no, right? So like extroversion, the other end of the coin is introversion, right? Uh, but they chose to do sort of the negative one for neuroticism. Um, and so it's essentially emotional instability. People who are high on neuroticism uh, are ineffective at problem solving and they have strong negative reactions to stress. It's negatively correlated with happiness, well being, and physical health. Uh, we know that mental and physical health are very tied. We also know that when you have symptoms of a mental disorder, often you don't take care of your physical health, right? Um, a general tendency towards psychopathology. Uh, and in terms of life outcomes, they tend to have problems in family relationships. They tend to be dissatisfied with their jobs and uh, they sometimes engage in criminal behavior. So here are some of the names the big five have been called in various studies. Um, so you can see that some people decide to call extroversion very different things like social adaptability or power, right? So this last row is very um, simplified, obviously. 
Um, agreeableness is sometimes called like likability or again, that conformity factor, conscientiousness. Some people, again, tie this very closely to that idea of motivation, will to achieve or responsibility. Um, emotionality is sometimes used for neuroticism or the opposite valence of emotional control. Um, and then here's where we get to, when we look at openness to experience, we see very different terms, right? So some people will just call it intelligence or intellect or inquiring intellect. Some people will call it culture. Um, so this is the one that people agree the least about. So researchers have specifically looked at, are these universal? Can you apply these across cultures, across languages? Um, so when you translate them to other languages, so you take a big five inventory and you translate it, and then you give it to people in that culture, then we tend to see four or five factors. However, if you start in the other language, so you start from that language rather than putting sort of our English-based Western assumptions on it, right? Um, we see more inconsistency. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence, but there is some overlap. So Yang and Bond looked at the five, big five in different cultures, uh, particularly Taiwan, and drew some interesting conclusions. I mean, one is not that <laughs> difficult to wrap your head around, right? Different cultures are different. But it's sad they have to say that because uh, some people don't remember that when we go to do psychological research. And the and most important thing I think is that there's enormous variation in people within cultures right? So I think partially because of the fundamental attribution error, we tend to think like, oh, we're really different, but everyone in a collectivist culture acts like X, right? But no, you have different personalities no matter where you are. And each culture uses different words to study people's personalities. And so one of the questions becomes, where do we come off applying our, again, like American or European-based theories to other cultures. And we get back to this nomothetic versus ideographic. Like, are we trying to apply one theory to everything and does that matter? Or is it more important to look at how personality manifests within each culture? So as I mentioned, OCEAN is the helpful acronym to so help you remember it. And so this chart, um, looks at different research that's been done across culturally. Um, so uh, Goldberg tried to put the uh, big five into questions you could ask. Um, so openness, smart or dumb? And again, like, oh, one, right? And B, like, that's not exactly all of that openness is, right? So that becomes potentially problematic. And what they found uh, in Yang and Bond's study is that it was related to a whole bunch of things. So the highest was competence incompetence, uh, which we might think would be most highly related to like conscientiousness, right? Social orientation, expressiveness, self-control. So again, we're already seeing that this is a way more complex. Uh, conscientiousness, Goldberg's question is, are you responsible, essentially? Um, Social orientation comes into play here. Self-control is the most, and that makes sense. Um, extroversion, Goldberg's question is, are you active, assertive? Uh, so again, social orientation here, you would think, again, maybe the highest, but no, it's expressiveness that's the highest. Social orientation, the highest with agreeableness, but also so with self-control, the same one that was high with conscientiousness. Uh, and again, Goldberg's question here is, are you warm and pleasant? And then eroticism is, are you emotionally stable? And here we see competence, impotence, uh, incompetent, impotence, there we go, blah, blah, uh, coming out the most. So again, these are really way more complicated, right? And especially when you look beyond our culture, right? Not everything is going to slot into these five little boxes. These are some of the life outcomes that are associated with different personality traits. So I've already mentioned some of these, right? But it's important to note that, you know, there are good ones and there are bad ones um, you know, for a lot of these. So 
again, like openness generally seems to be great, right? But uh, you could end up with substance abuse, right? Um, so uh, you can see there's all kinds of different things that have been researched. There's a lot of research done on the big five. So much so that like, for example, the MMPI has separate scales for the big five traits. Um, and I think there might be other personality inventories that include them as well. But obviously they've been criticized. So people want to look beyond the big five as well. So um, some argue, as we saw, if we go back two slides, right? And we look at Yang and Mons, we're seeing the same things correlated with the different traits and sometimes the same things being the most correlated with that trait. So people have said these aren't orthogonal. In fact, they are really related to each other. And maybe they're measuring a much more complex thing than just you know this, and it's actually the same thing. And also there's more to personality than just these five things, right? And like a good personality theorist knows that. Um, but I think that you know it can get watered down by sort of more of the lay people, right? Um, but also psychologists can get sucked into this, right? letting us all off the hook. Um, and some people have argued they're too broad for conceptual understanding. So if you tried to characterize something like authoritarianism that we talked about earlier as a combination of the big five, it would leave out other important concepts within that trait. And also you would kind of get away from the essence of the trait itself, right? Um, so it doesn't allow for easily explaining the whole of human experience. That being said, there's also a different way of looking at traits. Uh, and that is the typological approach to personality. And this is based on doubt about whether it's valid to compare people quantitatively on trait dimensions. Um, instead, they say we should sort patterns of traits into types. And they say that the important differences between people may be qualitative, not something we can quantify with a questionnaire and some statistics. So some challenges here are trying to find the divisions that distinguish the different types, like where you make those cutoffs, right? Um, and to come up with basic types that characterize the whole range of personality. So you start to sort of replicate some of the problems you have with traits, right? There are three replicable types that they have seen in multiple different studies. One is being well-adjusted. So adaptive, flexible, resourceful, um, and successful interpersonally. Then there's one that they came up with called maladjusted over-controlling. Um, so being too uptight, difficult to deal with, um, denying self-pleasure. So this is like Freud's anal retentive personality um, or what we would call type A personality or the personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, OCPD. There's also maladjusted under controlling or you might be too impulsive, engage in dangerous activity and that could wreak, self on, wreak havoc on yourself and others. Uh, but certain types don't predict behavior beyond what we can be predicted with trait scores. So it's like, do they actually give us something? I don't know. The old versions of the MMPI, the people were really into types. They're like, oh, well, if you're a one, three, whatever, it means X, Y, Z. But to be perfectly honest, when I was doing my interpretation, just like I just said, I didn't find it that much more helpful than looking at like what traits were popping out, what symptoms were popping out. Is it useful to think about people in terms of types instead of traits? Um, <laughs> the answer is yes, maybe, right? Um, so it is a summary of your standing on several traits. It can make it easier to think about how traits within a person interact with each other, right? But it's still not gonna tell you everything about that person. So some general criticisms of the trait approach is that uh, the factors are abstractions, right? So like, do they actually have meaning to a person? 
Factor analysis doesn't add anything to the data, right? It just takes the data you have, however good that data is, right? And lumps it into groups. So again, if you've translated a questionnaire to another language and it doesn't actually work, it'll still give you groups, right? Um, some people say it's premature to try to quantify things in this area, like we just don't have enough information or knowledge. Like, if we use this argument, like we wouldn't do anything in psychology, right? Like, it's such a young field. Uh, we can't let that hold us back, I think. Um, another critique is that this isn't a theory, right? People aren't trying to explain development. And that leaves a big question of like, how do traits develop? How do we get these things? How do we get to be these things? And the idea that they're relatively static over time and across different situations, both data and common sense suggest that individual difference variables don't necessarily operate like this. There are subtle interactions and trait theorists do acknowledge like, yeah, that's a problem. Personality traits are also not the only factors that control the behaviors. Situations are actually very important. Um, when I took social psych in grad school, our textbook was just called the person and the situation, right? It's both matter. Um, so uh, do traits exist? I mean, philosophical as well as data question, right? Uh, is everybody basically the same and behavior just changes according to the situation? Um, what we found is that trait stability does increase with age and trait stability is related to psychological adjustment. So it seems like not only are traits a thing, they're possibly related to psychological health. Um, and Michelle, who you will read for Wednesday, uh, said that behavior is too inconsistent across situations for individual differences to be characterized by traits. So he didn't buy into this at all. So you really get two sides of the coin in your readings for Wednesday. So in terms of focusing on situationism, um, people are free to do whatever they want. Everybody's equal and differences are a function of the situation rather than the person is the argument here. Um, so and again, that's in opposition to trait theorists or trait approach people who say that some people based on their traits are likely to have bad outcomes. It also thinks about personality's view of human nature. People can develop consistent identities and styles that allow them to be themselves across different situations. So how do we resolve this person situation debate? Um, this is how Funder tries to do it. He says people maintain their personalities even as they adapt their behavior to particular situations. That's probably a different page number in your book now. This is from like three editions ago. Um, people can flexibly adapt to situations and still have generally consistent personal styles. So the conclusion is that people are psychologically different and those differences matter, but that does not mean that the situation does not also matter. Alrighty, so I did plow through all these slides, which is awesome, because that means we can spend all of uh, Wednesday doing our discussion because we have three really good readings to dig into. So um, everybody have a good day, but in the both today and tomorrow. And um, I will stick around for any questions. See y'all later. Oh, and your exam scores are posted on Blackboard. Have a good day. You too. Have a good day. Hi, Professor Myers. Yes. Bye. <laughs> Can you like post where it shows us like what we answered and what the like right answer was? It should show it to you. Um, and I'm not sure how to get it because I don't have the student view of Blackboard. But if you Google like, how do I see that? It should give you instructions on how to do it. There's a lot of good Blackboard tutorials out there. Yeah, my view of Blackboard is completely different than yours. Yeah, because it just tells me what my score is and it doesn't let me like actually view the test, but like from my other classes, it does. You know, I wonder if that's because I said, like, after everybody's graded and there's one more person who has to take it. So probably after that person, uh, I get their score and they'll let you do it. Oh, OK. Oh, 
um, Dr. Myers, on the last, um, I was just looking ahead um, just to see the study guide and stuff for the our exam and everything, the next one. Um, but for one of the, the last set of slides for this, um, this information that's covered on the test, for some reason, I, I looked into it or I looked at it and it was like, I couldn't really read it because it was like a black, it was like black slides. And when I like, I like print them out to try and like follow along with like yeah. everything and like take notes as, as you go along. But I can't read when I printed it out. I was like, uh, I can't read this it's in black. <laughs> All right, I will um, put it on a different background and put it. Okay, on. that'd be awesome. Yeah, it's, it's so funny because that's been up there for years and no one ever told me. So that's. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. If you do that, that'd be awesome. No problem. So let me know. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too. How do we know where the readings are? So if you go to Blackboard into our class, there's a thing, I think even for this class, it says Blackboard readings. So um, there's two readings that are in your pieces book, and then one reading that's posted on Blackboard for Wednesday. Well, with, well last time I looked, it was like PDF, I thought. I don't, let me check now. Yep, yep. So there should be a PDF of the reading for Wednesday, and then the other two are in your pieces of the personality book. Did I just say that? Oh, yeah, I don't see. Blackboard reading. Oh, yeah, I see. Oh, I, I didn't understand, like, what. So we need to be reading assignment eight. So you're going to, if you look at the syllabus, that's probably what will be most helpful to you. Um, yeah, that's why I printed it off. I figured it. Yeah, if you look on the syllabus, it's like you read the reading by Alport and the reading by Michelle in the pieces book, and then you read um, the reading for, yeah, whatever assignment it is, um, but basically the one about trait theory, so. So we've been following the syllabus, right? Thank you. You're welcome.